Hi guys, uh, just a quick update for the FPGA uh, ADC DAC board. Uh, I managed to get the DAC working after a bit of a struggle. I made a series of mistakes and um, let's say bad decisions um, on how to test this. So I try to cut corners and I end up working more than it should. But anyway, it's working. Um, I'll turn the camera to show you the board. The board is very short. Uh, this is the board here, the DAC board. Uh, there is a red LED there, which is an alarm uh, LED for the FIFO, but it seems to be fine. And this is the, there are two signals in quadrature, a sinus and a cosinus, si sine and cosine. Uh, it works fine, so I'm, I'm happy with the quality. I still need to figure out the, the, the actual spectral quality of the signal, but I got it working. Uh, this is a 10 megahertz signal here, what you see on the screen. And um, yeah, the amplitude seems to be good. It's 1.13 volt peak to peak. So I'm happy with the results. Uh, and now uh, let's go straight to the mistakes or series of mistakes. About clocks. So I'm using an integrated circuit to generate the clocks. And I'm generating three different clocks. One is for the ADC. We are not talking about that now. Uh, and two clocks for the DAC. Why I need two clocks for the DAC? One clock is a very, very clean clock, which goes to the DAC. The DACs, they need clean clock if you want to generate good RF signal. And the second clock, it goes to the FPGA. It doesn't have to be that clean because, you know, FPGA, digital, it's a bit noisy. So we can, it can deal with a little bit more jitter. So basically forwarding one clock to the... FPGA and one clock straight to the DAC. Now the clock going to the DAC is the fastest um, possible, which was close to 500 megs, and the one going to <coughs> to the FPGA was uh, a little bit slower, but it was um, an integer division of the DAC clock. Now w what went wrong with the clocks? So, because I was lazy, I said I'm not going to program the internal register of this clock generator chip. Uh, I choose one of the fixed, uh, it has, this chip has some, you can pin strap some of the pins and uh, you can select different uh, modes here and I selected a mode, I'm not sure, here somewhere, I, I'm not going to go in details, I selected a mode which kind of suits me with the, with the values that it generated, I think pin mode uh, 15 it was for me, I'm not sure which one is, one of these, anyway. So this was generating the clocks that I thought that I'm fine with. And um, all those clocks are based on the crystal that you use, obviously. <clears throat> so the crystal here was, as you can see, 30.72 megahertz. And that was a decision which I took when I made the schematics. <clears throat> now, when I built the board, I didn't have a, a quartz of this value. So I put 30 megahertz, assuming that, okay, 30 megahertz instead of 30.72 is not going to make a big deal <coughs> because those frequencies they will shift slightly but they are going to shift by the same amount as they have it sh should work well it didn't and why it didn't because of this as you can see here there is a vco which has quite a tight range which i didn't knew back then uh, so by just changing here from 30 from 30 to 30.7 let's go back to the 71 and i say okay you see the the vco actually goes over three um, three gigahertz so anyway my point was that the vco was out of range uh, this chip was losing lock and all my clocks they were not what they supposed to be Let's go here, 29 megahertz to prove my point. You see here is in red. So 2.9 gigahertz on the VCO, it's, it's out of range already. So this is one megahertz different here on the, <coughs> on the reference uh, quartz. So that was the, the first mistake that I didn't put exactly the quartz that I, I was designing for. So anyway, I realized pretty quick, okay, this is not going to lock. I uh, And how I figure out, I actually hooked the SPI interface and I was reading all the registers. So this chip has a bunch of registers and I figure out, okay, it's not in lock. 
So I said, okay, now I have <coughs> I have access to the SPI registers. Let's put the right value. Anyway, I designed in for exactly the cards that I have, and I put the right values, and uh, <coughs> I start measuring the clocks. Then I realized, okay, the clocks they uh, <coughs> they are too fast for my scope. So I lower down the clocks to a point where I can actually see them on the scope. And then the next mistake. <coughs> I realized that the clocks, they have very little amplitude. I said, what the, what the hell is going on there? Why they don't have the amplitude like in the data sheet? And after uh, some reflection, uh, I realized that I'm using some very old probes, which they are 60 megahertz, trying to look at the clock, which was 200 megahertz. And they were, obviously, they were low pass filtering the signal. So <clears throat> the amplitude was half of what it's supposed to be. Change the, put the right probes, the signal was fine. So the clock was sorted. <clears throat> Okay, before we dive into the DAC thing, uh, I'll explain what I put on the FPJ. So on the FPJ, very, very simple. Uh, this DAC is actually made of two DACs. So it's sending data source synchronous. So the data is traveling with his own clock. And uh, for channel A, or for the first DAC, the data is registered inside the DAC on the rising edge of the data clock and for the, the other channel is for the falling edge. So it's a DDR sampling scheme. So all those connections are LVDS, <coughs> low voltage differential single, signaling. So what I put in the FPJ, I put a numerically controlled oscillator or a DDS uh, <coughs> oscillator. And on the first channel, I put the uh, sinus and on the second channel, I put the cosine. So signals in quadrature okay so some the nco here the dds nco stands for numerical control oscillator and some simple logic here some um, <coughs> ddr registers to sample correctly the to send out correctly the the ddr signal for the data bus and the clock now with the clock i generated actually two clocks inside the fpga the clock that is used for the DDS, and then a second clock which travels with the data, which is 90% shifted. So why is 90% shifted? It's to make sure that the clock is actually sampling in the middle of the eye. To make sure we poke him in the eye. Okay, <clears throat> so now the DAC. <clears throat> I did pretty much everything. I didn't refresh any i didn't change any um, uh, internal register values so the DAC has some internal registers but <clears throat> the defaults they were okay with me anyway nothing shows up but the output panic then i said okay i need to look carefully to the <clears throat> internal registers i start looking at the registers the changing values and things and the try different uh, combinations nothing dead and then i said no it's something it's something more it should be something more obvious here is not so much about the internal registers and so it proves to be a very very silly hardware mistake and i'll show you <clears throat> there is a bias resistor here like the r11 i'll just make it larger right so this is actually setting up the is biasing some internal circuitry which is enabling the outputs <clears throat> they actually drivers the bias for the output drivers now it proves to be on the board that I have a capacitor here instead of a, so I had no bias for the output stage, so no signals whatsoever they were generated. Change this with a, <clears throat> with the right value and signals start to show up. Now this is a condensed story. It took me two days to get this going. Uh, <clears throat> I was very close to nearly to give up. <clears throat> so that's it. <clears throat> it's working. I'm uh, happy. Uh, I started here the spectrum analyzer on the scope, and I need to. So this is a 10 megahertz signal, right? So you see here, uh, sorry, this is touch screen. I'm still not used to it, um, right? So seems fine. I mean, seems to be pretty clean spectrally, if I can say so. Um, yeah. So this concludes the video. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed it and I'll keep you posted with uh, more measurements.